Good morning, welcome to Joy Church Grants Pass online service. We are so excited to see you here this morning. It's gonna be great. Hey Joy Church, thankfully there is youth tonight. It's from six to 8 p.m. at the youth building. Anyone from junior high to high school is invited and it's gonna be a super fun time. We can't wait to see you there. All right, now it's time to worship, so feel free to stand up, raise your hands, and sing to the Lord this morning. Oh, Free. 
what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive The tender whisper of love In the dead of night And you tell me That you're pleased And that I am never alone You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, and I 
I, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, love As you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Father, it's who you are, who you are, it's who you are, and I am loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. In all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways. To us, oh, to us.
declare who you are I'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart will sing of how great we're singing you are holy great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you are I'm so Now, let's dive into the Word with Pastor Aaron this morning. Hi everyone, welcome to Joy Church. Can we just take one second and just agree about how mad we are at how good telephone companies are, cell phone companies are at marketing new phones to us? I mean, whatever phone you have, it's already in danger of becoming like the worst phone ever. You can have the, the last, latest, and greatest model, and a TV commercial will come on, or on Facebook, or whatever. You'll see an ad, and the new version is coming out. You can have the iPhone 47. You can have the Samsung Planet Galaxy Universe, whatever. And the new one coming out always has the most amazing techno gadgetry. It's like a Swiss Army knife. It's got 17 cameras, it's got um, screen so sharp that it'll make your eyes bleed. I mean, it can intercept your thoughts. It can make snow cones and delicious coffee beverages for you. Um, I mean, they can do like just about everything. Some of them even have come out with radar. They have radar built into them so they can sense you coming. They can sense how close you are so that when you're about to pick one up, it, it can see you and it thinks, I better wake up and turn on the screen because my master, my owner, is, is coming to fetch me and I have to be ready for their arrival. And what it happens is you, you watch this marketing and you see these advertisements and you go, man, I, I've been living in the Stone Ages. I've been rubbing sticks together to make fire. I mean, what kind of a troglodyte am I? I? I need to get this new phone because it has so many features that I'm supposed to be using. And what happens is when you go out and you get this phone and don't act like this isn't you. I mean, Apple is a trillion dollar company for a reason. It's kind of like McDonald's. We all say we don't like it, but how come they've sold 90 billion hamburgers? So we go out and you, you buy a brand new phone and you get it and, and you you are almost overwhelmed by all these new features and you have it and a couple weeks go by and all of a sudden you recognize, you know what? For all that this technological device can do, really the only thing I do with it is exactly what I did before. I make phone calls and send texts, browse the internet, use a couple of apps. Most of us are not like these power users who just like use every single feature of the phone. Most of us just kind of use it as a normal device. And sometimes you can, you can have this phone and it's overwhelming how many features it has and how many things it can do. And you're asking this question, uh, okay, I have it and I have all this, this capability right in the palm of my hand, but now what? Now what? What, what do I do with it? I, I feel like I'm missing out on something. There was so much fanfare. There was so much hype, but now what? And now what is an excellent question. I think oftentimes when we celebrate Easter, sort of like we did last week, and if you were with us either online or at our live service, we just wanted to say, we want to say, uh, thanks for joining us. We had an amazing time, really great time, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But sometimes there can be so much fanfare, so much busyness, so much fun and tradition and dinners and friends and all of that, that you can have the event, you can celebrate the event of Easter, you can celebrate the resurrection, but then you can kind of ask this question, well, now what? I mean, it, we're, we're a week beyond that. We're, we're the next Sunday. We, we've forgotten about all that. Now we're looking towards the next thing. I mean, what, what was the resurrection 
supposed to mean? I mean, what do we do with our lives now at this point? Was Easter just kind of some fun thing that we celebrated and then it kind of out of sight, out of mind until till next year when we get really excited and, and busy leading up into, into Easter? And so I think this now what question is, it should be on our minds. What should our lives be like in light of the fact of the resurrection? And I think that the Bible answers this question um, not through just kind of trite stories and tropes, but I, I think that the disciples were asking this very same question. The disciples had been relying on the person of Jesus Christ to inform what, what Christianity was, was supposed to be like, what the future of the Jews' faith and their, their nation was supposed to be. They, 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 they knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Deliverer, that he, he was a miracle worker, that he was this powerful Son of God, but they, I think, believed that he was going to restore some sort of political power and some national freedom to them. And when he came and he ushered in this different sort of kingdom, this, this kingdom that he said is not an earthly kingdom, it's, it's a heavenly kingdom, it's something different than what you had envisioned, they were, they were thrown. And then when he was crucified, they were doubly thrown. They did not know what to do with that. All of their hopes rested in Jesus, which is a good thing, but when Jesus turned out to do and possibly be something different than they had expected, they didn't know what to do with it. And so they were asking this question, now what? They were, they were answering this question with their lives. Listen to this, this story. Uh, we're going to read after um, the events that we read and looked at last week. Now we're looking at the very end of the book of John in chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And it says, after this, meaning after these events that had taken place, the, the resurrection, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Now, this is not the way that you typically announce that you are going to go fishing. Um, when I call a friend to say that I'm going golfing, some hobby that I have, I do not call them and say, hello, I am going golfing. You don't say it like that. When you're excited about something, you're like, dude, let's go rip some drives. Let's throw some darts into the green. We're going to get some birdies. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Let's get up at like five in the morning to go do this thing that we love. You, you don't say, I am going golfing. It's, it's not that way, but this is what Peter said. And really what he was probably saying was, I am going back to my old way of life. This thing with Jesus didn't pan out the way that I thought it was going to. Uh, if you read the beginning of the Gospels, you'll find out that Peter was a fisherman by trade and that Jesus called him into ministry with himself while Peter was, was fishing. Him and some of the others, other disciples were, were fishing. And so by, Peter, by saying this statement, was likely saying, and I can't prove this is the case, but he is likely saying, this thing with Jesus didn't work out the way that we thought. Now what? Now what do we do? Well, I guess all that's left for us is, is to go back into our old trade, our old way of life. Jesus is, is gone. And he, whether, whether Peter knew he had resurrected, because Jesus had shown up to some of the disciples, we don't exactly know to who, but whether Peter had seen him in his resurrected form or not, he still apparently had the impression that this thing is over. Uh, I guess we just go back to our old way of living. And the, the other disciples responded. They said uh, to him, we will go with you. And that's just not the normal sort of conversation that you have when you're going to go fishing. Now, obviously, these guys weren't going fishing for fun. These guys were going fishing because that was their trade. And I think oftentimes we can have the same experience. Oh, Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, Jesus is this amazing historical figure. Jesus wants to take our sins away and do something amazing through my life. Oh, um, well, you know, I had this bad experience or I walked away or whatever the reason is. And I, I guess I'll just go back to my old way of life. I guess this is just normal me. This is just what I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. And that's kind of what the disciples were buying into at this moment. They said, we'll go with you. They then went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
And that is just a sorry picture. There are some guys that were doing something they didn't want to do. Uh, they were fishing all through the night because that's typically how they fished in this place and at this time. After sitting there in a boring, stinky boat all night long, not only have you gone back to your old way of life, not only are you in a, a, a terrible, destitute place, you also didn't even catch anything. You're not getting any fish and you're not making any money. This is like as, as low as you can get. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They said to him, no. Now, I don't totally know what's going on here. I, I don't know if there's a way to know what's going on. Um, Jesus is like a total swag daddy here. I mean, if you, if you go to your local fishing hole, um, those guys are pretty gnarly. Like, they will cut you. I don't know if you've ever, like like fished near someone who's fishing by the hatchery or anything like that, but they, they will jump kick you. They will not lose sleep over it. And Jesus comes out and says, children, have you caught, any, caught anything? Like, go try that. I dare you. And it, it says that they answered him, no. That has to be sassy. Like, either that or just totally mopey, you know? Hey, kids, did you catch anything? No. You know, like there's no way this could have been a normal conversation. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, if you've ever fished before, like how wide is the boat? Like 10 feet, 12 feet, maybe if it's fairly large. I mean, it's probably just a few feet. Like what's the difference? If you're throwing a net in and you don't catch them on one side, you're probably not going to catch them on the other side either. But I think they start to get an inkling of what's going on here because Jesus had done this same miracle way back in the beginning of the book. This is when he called them into service. This is when they called them into his ministry. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John talking about himself. I mean, come on, that's awesome. Therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. That's not typically the steps that you take when you go swimming. Normally you take things off before you jump into the ocean. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, he took bread with them and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was re revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So you see some of these the sequence happening, and, and believe it or not, a lot of the actions that Jesus is performing right here mirror the same actions that have led up to this point. He, he calls the disciples, he reveals himself, he he performs a miracle in their sight. He does something so that they recognize that this guy has power. He even brings them up and has a meal with them, which would um, parallel the meal that they had just a week before this when Jesus instituted the, the Lord's Supper or communion. He broke bread together with them. And, and now, post-resurrection, he's bodily or physically enjoying eating a meal with them again. And so listen to this next, next exchange that takes place starting in 15. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Now, you have to couch this conversation in the context of what had just happened days earlier. Now, Jesus told Peter, because Peter was bragging. He was like, Jesus, we'll follow you to death. Like, we know that you're the Messiah, you're the man, like, we'll go wherever you go, whatever you do, like, we are on board with your mission. And Jesus gets back to him and he goes, actually, before the rooster crows, um, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, whoa, no way, bro. I'm like, I'm all in. This is like, dude, we're, we're in it to win it. And Jesus just is like, listen, He's prophetically calling him out, saying, I know what's going to happen. In fact, it's going to happen so that scripture may be fulfilled. And 
sure enough, what happens is that when the people surrounding Jesus and those who know that he's going to be crucified, they know that there is tension happening, that the Jews are going to offer Jesus over to the Romans. They, they point out Peter and they go, hey, this guy Peter was with this guy Jesus. They're, they're part of the same crew. And Peter went, no, 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 we're not. And sure enough, he denies Jesus. He denies his Lord and Savior. He, after talking uh, a big game, when it finally comes down to it and his own skin is on the line, Peter bailed out. And sure enough, the rooster crowed and Peter realized, because Jesus looked at him, in that moment, Peter realized, I have denied my, my Lord, my God, my best friend. And it says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. And so this happened just a few days earlier. And then Jesus was crucified and now Jesus has shown back up in, in Peter's life and he's about to have this conversation with him. He, he orchestrates this miraculous kind of scene that exactly parallels how he had called his disciples and especially Peter the first time. And so they sit down, they have breakfast, and Jesus looks at Simon Peter and you know Simon Peter is like, oh, here it comes. It's like when your kids get in trouble when they're in the backseat of the minivan and you're like, you just wait till we get home. And the whole time they're like, oh my gosh, the tension is worse than the punishment itself. Just like get it over with. And so Peter is sitting there and Jesus asked him, he said, Simon, that's another name for Peter. He says, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, scholars don't know exactly what Jesus was referring to in this instant. He's either saying, do you love me more than you love these other disciples? Or he's saying, do you love me more than these disciples love me? Or he's saying, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Because that was the subject in the context here. And it very likely could be that that's what he means. That Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than you like your previous life? In fact, Jesus, by performing this miracle, is saying, he might be saying, Peter, do you love me more than what I can provide for you? Do you actually love me as a person? And Peter responds, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He, Jesus, said to Peter, feed my lambs. Then Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And why is Jesus asking this? Well, you'll remember that Jesus told Peter, hey, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And again, this parallels. He asks three times, Peter, do you love me? And this blows me away. This, this really is interesting to me because I, I, I think that most of us can probably see ourselves in this situation. We recognize ourselves that Jesus has called us into a life with him, into a relationship with him, into righteousness and purity and this sinless life with him. And sometimes we miss it. We miss the mark. We mess up. We get things sideways. We get things wrong. And Jesus didn't ask him over and over, are you sorry? Peter, are you sorry? Peter, do you feel bad? Do you feel guilty? Do you feel condemned? The answer to all of those would probably be yes. But Jesus asked, do you love me? Because that's the most important question that he could ask. Even if Peter did mess things up, and he royally messed things up, betraying the Lord of glory, like in his hour of need when he was going to suffer on the cross and suffer the, uh, the abandonment and forsaking of the Father, like he, he needed his bros, he needed his posse, he needed his people there. This is like the, the worst betrayal that you could possibly commit. But Jesus didn't ask, how bad do you feel? He didn't ask, are you aware of your sin? I guarantee Peter was aware of his sin. He asked the most important question that could be asked, do you love me? And I think that whoever you are and whatever you've done, you might feel like um, the only question that Jesus would ever ask you is, did you do something wrong and do you feel bad about it? 
And the answer is yes. But I think what Jesus is asking you and what he's asking me and what he's asking all of us all the time is, do you love me? Because the answer to that question will dictate everything that we do from this point on. That question, the answer to that question will dictate the now what? Now that I know that the Lord of glory, that Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, now that I know that he loves me because he crawled up on the cross and, and he took the stripes on his back with the whips for my punishment and he took the, the, the abandonment of the Father, the wrath of the Father for my sin, he's proved that he loved me. Like, if I would be embarrassed to ask Jesus, Jesus, do you love me? He'd be like, do you see these scars? Did you see this pain? Did you see this sacrifice that I went through? But him asking me, do you love me? My answer to that dictates, now what? Um, even if I have messed up, even if I have sinned, even if I have betrayed the Lord, the question is not, do I feel bad? The question is, do I, do I love him? And that's the question that you have to answer and I have to answer because that question is going to control what we do. Not just how we feel, it's going to control how we actually live. And so Jesus goes on, or Peter goes on after the third time that he was asked, and he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now listen to what Jesus, how he ends this conversation. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. So what Jesus is saying is, you were scared before. You betrayed me before. You, when, it, the, when it got... When the goings got rough, you, you left, you, you bounced out. But now, even though I know that you love me, and even though I couldn't trust you last time, I'm telling you prophetically, even though you love me, what it's going to cost you to love me, and that is that in the future, you're going to be taken to a place that you don't want to be, and you're going to be crucified in order to glorify me. Now, that's, that's just... That's not the kind of prophecy that you want to hear. I mean, you want to hear about riches and fame and all kinds of great comfort that's coming your way. And Jesus said, that's not what's going to happen. He said that you're going to glorify God in the way that you are crucified. And as far as we know, Peter was led to his crucifixion. And when they led him to his cross, he said, don't you dare crucify me the same way that you crucified my Lord and Savior. Flip me upside down and crucify me that way. Now, that is swag right there. That's a, that's a stud. That is somebody who had been radically transformed from a chicken, from a coward, to somebody who said, uh, whatever Jesus had to go through on the cross, I want mine to be even more humiliating and very likely even more painful because I'm not even worthy to be crucified in the same manner that he was. Talk about a change of character. Talk about the change that can come over somebody when they recognize the love that Jesus has for them and the fact that he wants our love in return. The most important question you could ask when you say, now what? The most important question is, do I love Jesus? Do I reciprocate his love to me? And that answer might be yes, and it might be no. And what I want to say, the most important thing that you could ever ask yourself is, do I accept this love from Jesus Christ? Do I accept that the God of the universe would pour himself out for me and, and he would want me, he would desire me, he, he wants me to be close, he wants me to be family, even if I have messed things up, even if I have betrayed him, even if I have gone exactly the wrong direction, the question that you have to answer is, do you love him? And listen to what the very last thing that Jesus says. This is the ultimate question to now what? He says, after saying this, he, Jesus, said to Peter, follow me.
That's the first thing he said to him as well. You can read about it in John chapter 1, in the beginning of all the Gospels, when Jesus calls his disciples, he says, come and follow me. And all the events that took place, they were following Jesus to the cross. But even after the cross, when Jesus was going to ascend, after he had done his earthly ministry, he still said, follow, follow me. And if he was referring to his earthly ministry the first time, what was he referring to the second time? And I would suggest that if you turn the page after John 21 and you open up the book of Acts, you will find that the disciples continued to follow Christ in the earthly ministry that he was calling them into and also calling us into. He was calling them to follow him into the fulfillment of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, and I don't know if we'll go into a series on this. I really want to, but I'm not totally sure yet. But I would suggest that Jesus was calling Peter and he was calling his disciples into the very same thing that he's calling you and me into. And that is to recognize him as Lord and Savior and open our lives up to the person of the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ, he still wants to do the same things that he did in the first century church through his disciples. He wants to do those same things through you and through me. He wants to achieve miraculous things. He wants to see people who are lost and far from God and broken and rejected. He wants to see them miraculously come to life by the power of his Holy Spirit. He wants to show off. He wants to bring himself glory. He wants to show up in people's lives in a way that they say, my word, I could, I, I could never deny the power. I could never deny the fact that Jesus has, he has left the 99 and he has come after me, this lost and broken sheep that never deserved him. And I ran as far and as fast as I could from him. He wants to track you down and he wants to track down others through you. He wants his Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you in a way that is just so far beyond anything that you could ever ask or imagine. And maybe you say, I don't understand all that. I don't even know if I want all that. You don't have to understand all of it. What you have to understand is that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, the creator God, he has such amazing and deep love for you, for me, for people. And he's asking this question, do you love me? And our response is something that he dignifies for whatever reason. If we say no, he says, okay. And if we say, yes, Jesus, I do love you, then he responds, then follow me. And if you'd like to follow him, if you'd like to answer the question, now what? If you'd like to begin this faith journey, I'd invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I want to follow. I don't even know everything that it will cost me, but I know what it cost you. It cost you everything. And because of your great love, because of the fact that you would transform my life, I'll follow you. Jesus, there's no one like you. There never has been and there never will be. Thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that you would save someone like me. I want to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in for Sunday service this morning. Just a reminder, we have live services in downtown Grants Pass at the Rogue Theater Sunday at 10 a.m. every week. If you want more information, you can shoot us an email at joychurchgp at gmail.com or head to our website, joygrantspass.com, where we have access to our sermon archives, information about who we are as a church, and links to give. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Can't wait to see you next week.